Achilles are, without a doubt, among the most beautiful fish in the aquarium hobby. With a few exceptions, they aren't sold in stores. So beginners often don't get the chance to learn about them and miss out on keeping them. For a long time, you could get them only through killifish clubs, small groups of killie specialists that meet in members' houses. Now you can order them on the internet, but killies have a reputation as a specialist fish that you need special knowledge to keep. In this video, I'll cut through the mystery and explain how you can succeed with this beautiful group of fishes. I'm Bob, and this is Sonny's Fish Room. The name killifish probably comes from the Dutch term kilfis. Kill means riverbed or water channel and fis means fish. The term killifish was likely handed down from the Dutch settlers of the New Netherlands colony of North America, now part of modern New York and New Jersey, where many bodies of water are still called kills. According to Wikipedia, there are 1,270 species of killifish found in fresh, brackish, and salt waters of North and South America, Europe, Asia, and Africa. Achilles aren't fussy eaters. They'll eat all kinds of flake food, crumbles, and small pellets. I feed mine a homemade mix. They also benefit from live and frozen foods like brine shrimp and bloodworms. The most important thing for any new killie keeper to know is that killies like to jump. Sooner or later, most killie species will leap out of a tank if they get the chance. Most killie specialists keep their fish in small breeding tanks with sponge filters or box filters and only a small opening for an airline. I cover my tanks with sheets of polycarbonate, sold in hardware stores as Lexan. I use a jigsaw to cut a tiny opening for the airline. Setting up a show tank for Killies is a little more challenging. The standard setup with a hood and a hang on the back filter won't work. Hang on the back filters need a small opening to draw water in and cycle it back to the tank. And even if the opening is small, Killies will find it and jump right through it. So if you want to keep killies in a show tank, you can't use a hang on the back filter. You need to use an internal filter that you can put a cover over. If you search internal filter, you'll see that there are lots of models available. I use a power head with a pre-filter. I cover the tank with polycarbonate sheets. I use a jigsaw to cut small openings in the polycarbonate just large enough to hang the power head on the side of the tank. A sand bed hosts the denitrifying bacteria for biological filtration. If you make a mistake and cut the opening too big, you can cut some plastic canvas to size and fill the gap. Most killie hobbyists have species-only tanks. This is to keep different killie species from hybridizing with each other but it's also because a lot of killie species are feisty and can be tough on other fish. If you plan to keep killies in a community tank, watch out for new fish after you put them in the tank and have a spare tank ready to put the newcomers in if things get out of hand. For breeding purposes, there are two main types of killies, annuals and non-annuals. Annuals live in habitats that are rainy and wet for part of the year and dry for the rest of the year. They only have a short time to hatch, grow up, and lay their eggs before their habitat dries out. The eggs settle in the mud and hatch months later when it rains again. Among the most well-known annuals are the Notobranchius group in southern Africa. I don't recommend annuals for beginners, so I won't spend much time on them. It's a little tricky to get the eggs to hatch. You have to provide them with tubs of spawning material either peat moss or ground coconut shells. After they lay their eggs, you collect the spawning material, dry it until it's only slightly damp, and store it in a plastic bag for a couple of months or so to simulate a dry season. Then you submerge the spawning material and wait for the eggs to hatch. Not all the eggs will hatch at once, so you have to re-dry the spawning material and repeat the process a few more times. Non-annual killies are a lot easier. You don't have to simulate a dry spell to breed them. These are usually bred with yarn mops. You make the mops by winding yarn around a book. I use a synthetic yarn like 100% acrylic. Tying the top part together, 
I like to use a cable tie, and then cutting the bottom strands. The fish lay their eggs in the mop. You check the mop every couple of days or so, pick through it, and remove the eggs to another container. Methylene blue or a rooibos tea bag will protect the eggs from fungus. Some species like to spawn near the surface. You can tie a cork to the top so the mop will flow. Killifry fry are easy enough to feed. You can start them off on infusoria and vinegar eels and switch them over to powdered fry food. Some species have fry that are large enough to take baby brine shrimp right away. With a lot of species, you can put the eggs on damp peat moss or coconut shell husk and store them for a week or two until you're ready to hatch them. This will allow you to collect a lot of eggs and hatch them at the same time instead of in small groups. Aphiosemians are a large group of non-annual killies from West Africa. Aphiosemian species that are easy to keep and sometimes available at fish club auctions include Aphiosemian bivitatum, Aphiosemian striatum, and Aphiosemian austral, which has an orange color morph. Fungulopanchax killies also appear in club auctions. These are another group of non-annual species from Africa. Fungulopanchax gardneri is one you see often. This species is easy to keep and breed. You might see a name after a species name, like Fungulopanchax gardneri mccurdy. That third name is usually a location where the strain was originally collected. Most serious killifish hobbyists don't like to mix fish from different locations. This is to keep fish that are in the hobby as much like the wild type fish as possible. It's also to avoid creating hybrids. Many location variants are also different subspecies, and a lot of species aren't well studied. So it's possible that science will one day find out that what we think of as location variants of one species are actually different species. For some Aphiosemian and Fungulopanchax species, you may not need a mop. For example, you may be able to colony breed Aphiosemian striatum, Fungulopanchax gardneri, and Fungulopanchax shieli. You can try adding a single pair to a tank crowded with java moss or other plants. Enough of the young may make it to adulthood to eventually give you a small colony. There are also a few species that you'll sometimes see in stores. Aplochylus lineatus, or the striped panchax, is native to India and Sri Lanka. The yellow form is most common and is sold as the golden wonder killifish. There is also a red color morph. These are an easy annual killie that will spawn in a mop, but you have to be careful with them. Their mouths are large and they'll eat small fish like neon tetras if they get the chance. You sometimes see Lucania gudii, the bluefin killifish in stores, but not in display tanks. You need to look in the feeder tanks. Sometimes they come in as bycatches in shipments of feeder shrimp or feeder guppies. Blue fins are native to the southeastern United States, Florida, Alabama, and Georgia, but introduced into Texas, South Carolina, North Carolina, and California. They're small, only about an inch long. They'll spawn in mops, but you need to collect the eggs or they'll eat the fry. They like to be in water with high carbonate hardness. I found that adding a teaspoon per gallon of salt to their tank increases their survival. Jordanella floridae, the flagfish, is also sold in stores. These are also native to Florida. They belong to a subgroup of killies called pupfish. Pupfish are shorter and stouter than most other killie groups, and they usually prefer the bottom part of the tank. They are territorial and can be tough on other fish. Flagfish like hard water and also do well with a teaspoon of salt per gallon of tank water. A benefit of flagfish is that they'll eat algae, even hair algae. Flagfish are mop spawners too, and they'll also eat their fry if you don't collect the eggs. I hope I've shown you that killies are easy to keep and worth trying, even if you don't have a lot of fish keeping experience. In a short video like this, I could only scratch the surface. There are a multitude of other killie species, and I didn't even get to mention those in South America. For more information, the best place to get started is the website of the American Killifish Association, 
www.aka.org. It's a group of established hobbyists with extensive experience keeping killies. The AKA has an annual meeting and many local affiliates that meet periodically. As always, I look forward to hearing from you. If you have a question or would like to share your killie experiences, please leave me a comment. And it would really help me out if you could subscribe to my channel. Thanks for watching.